seminar. And um, so Stephen uh, is joining us from uh, the UK, uh, where he is a Royal Society University Research Fellow um, at, the, at University College in London. Um, I met Stephen when he was still a PhD student, um, and he's worked on a wide range of, um, of subjects in cosmology, uh, starting from the largest scales observable to observation, uh, even beyond the confines of uh, merely our observable universe, uh, including bubble collisions, detecting uh, signatures of fundamental physics. Uh, he's even written something about uh, cosmic textures. Um, and in recent times has um, focused on um, uh, the question of um, how to uh, address this Hubble tension, how to find new information about the Hubble tension. Um, we share an interest in methodology and how to uh, obtain the um, information, the cosmological information from astronomical data sets. And I've had the pleasure to collaborate with him on questions re related to um, simulation based inference or likelihood free inference. He's, uh, he's made important contributions. Um, and, uh, but in particular, he's um, focused uh, on the problem of how to use um, gravitational wave, the new gravitational wave um, window on the universe to help with uh, the Hubble constant uh, trouble. And um, I think that's what he's going to tell us about today. So uh, here he is clarifying the Hubble constant tension. Stephen. Uh, thank you, Ben. And um, yeah, thank you all for uh, inviting me. Right, so let me share my screen and play this. So yeah, I'm not on the world's greatest connection. So if I start breaking up, please just shout at me and I will turn my video off and hopefully that will work better. Um, yes, right. So uh, yeah, I'm Stephen Feeney I'm from UCL. Um, and I wanted to talk today about clarifying the Hubble constant tension. As Ben said before the talk, I'm not gonna give you the answer, sorry. Um, so yeah, if you wanted the answer, then, then feel free to to, to turn this off. Um, but I'm going to talk about some work um, that I've done with my collaborators, and particularly Hiranya Pires, Daniel Mortluck, and Samaya Nisanka, and my PhD student, uh, Francesca Girardi. Um, right, so uh, to give you a very brief outline of, uh, uh, of, of, of what I'm going to be talking about, um, let me just check the time so I know how long I'm going on for. Um, yeah, so I wanted to give a, a very uh, broad uh, view of the topic, I guess. So I'll start off by describing what the tension is um, um, uh, and how it manifests and, and what the potential explanations are. Um, and then I'll spend the bulk of the talk talking about how um, new uh, electromagnetic and gravitational wave observations can help uh, explain the cause. Um, and so, yeah, oh, hang on, let me see if that'll work. There we go. So start at the beginning, right? So, so what is the Hubble constant? Um, so the Hubble constant is just the, the, the current expansion rate of the universe, okay? And so we've known that the universe has been uh, expanding for almost a hundred years now. Um, <clears throat> uh, and, and ever since we discovered that fact, we've, we've wanted to, to, to measure how quickly this expansion is going because it can tell us lots of interesting stuff, right? About the size, the age of the universe, things like that. Um, so how do we do that? Uh, well, as, as Hubble himself told us, um, uh, and others at the same time, um, basically what we need to do is we need to find some objects uh, and, and figure out their redshift. So basically the, the velocities at which they're moving away from us um, and their distances. Um, and then the ratio of those two quantities gives us H naught, right? It gives us this expansion rate of the universe. And so this is cool because this is a genuinely local measurement of the universe using nearby astrophysical objects. And, and so we could do this. And the best way that we have of doing this right now is using something called the Cepheid supernova distance ladder, which, which I'll describe in detail in the next few slides. The best distance ladder that we have is, is, is uh, put together by the SHOES collaboration led by Adam Reese. Um, and when we do that, we get this purple curve here, right? So we get a measurement of the, of the Hubble constant, which is 73.5 kilometers per second per megaparsec, plus or minus around 2% precision. Um, so the really nice thing, uh, the, the pretty unique thing about the Hubble constant is that it's a, it's a cosmological parameter, right? So that, that, that means that 
We can also take some other cosmological data um, and, and a cosmological model, and we can fit that model and generate essentially a prediction um, or an inference of, of what, what the Hubble constant should be given this other data and the cosmological model. And so it's really nice, right? Because we have this built-in test of, of our cosmological models. And so if we take our best cosmological model, that's the anisotropies of the cosmic microwave background as measured by the Planck satellite, and we plug in our, our best guess at what the cosmological model is, so lambda CDM, then we would infer or predict uh, that, the, that the Hubble constant should come out at around 67.4 kilometers per second per megaparsec with sub percent precision. Um, and so clearly these th two things uh, completely disagree, okay? At, you know, four plus sigma, depending on, 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 um, on which particular data set you consider. So um, let's have a look at the, the two different methods in a little bit of detail to, to see if we can figure out, you know, uh, potential causes for this disagreement. So let's look at the, the, the local direct uh, measurement um, uh, first, right? So, so Hubble told us this is simple, right? All we need to do is we need to calculate some redshifts and some distances for some objects and, and then we get the Hubble constant out. Um, except it's never as simple as that, right? Uh, the, the, the main complication here is the fact that objects don't just sit still in, in, in the Hubble flow in the expanding universe, right? They get attracted by other massive objects, um, clusters, things like that. And so they have their own peculiar velocities. And you can see that if this peculiar velocity has some specific or typical size, that means that it dominates over the expansion term, this H naught times distance term, um, out to some specific distance. So that means that peculiar velocities make things hard um, unless you're looking at distant objects, so objects that are, you know, maybe 100 megaparsecs away or something like that. And so these redshifts only um, uh, are dominated by the expansion term uh, for, for quite distant objects. The problem there is that measuring large distances in astrophysics is, is very challenging, right? You know, we have reliable, uh, simple um, distance measurements only for very nearby objects, so things that are, you know, uh, kiloparsecs away, I guess, because we can measure things like parallaxes um, uh, and, and other geometric distances um, on those scales. And so we have this kind of scale problem, right? We can measure distances out to, or we can measure reliable distances out to quite small distances. We can measure reliable redshifts out of quite large distances, and we have to join this together. And the way that we do that is, is, is using this distance ladder. Um, I mean, fundamentally what the distance ladder does is it allows you to calibrate standard candles, right? So objects where um, you know that the object has a, has a particular intrinsic brightness, right? So if you can measure the distance to one of these objects, you can figure out its intrinsic brightness, and then you can observe other uh, examples of these objects further away and compare the apparent brightness to the intrinsic brightness in order to get their distances. So on the right-hand side is a plot here. This is a plot from the Shoes paper showing what they do. Um, what their actual um, uh, distance ladder is, is even more complicated than what I was saying there. And that's because um, standard candles are, um, basically either very bright and rare or, or not so bright and common. So we need bright things to see them very far away, uh, far enough away for their peculiar velocities to not be a, a, an, an issue. But obviously we don't see these bright objects um, next to us, for example, in the Milky Way, which would allow us to calibrate their intrinsic brightness. And so we have to cobble together this distance ladder from multiple populations of standard candles. So what the Shoes team do um, is they use Cepheids, um, so pulsating variable stars. You can see Cepheids in the Milky Way, you can see them in the Large Magellanic Cloud and other places where we have um, reliable distance measurements. And so we can figure out the intrinsic brightness of Cepheids. Then we can look a little bit further out into the universe and we can find galaxies that have populations of Cepheids and a type 1a supernova. Right? Type 1a supernovae are another type of standard candle that are much, much brighter and we can see them you know, kind of halfway across the observed universe. But so if we can observe Cepheids in a galaxy, we can figure out its distance. If we see a supernova in that galaxy, we can then figure out its intrinsic brightness. And then we can look further out into the universe um, and just find uh, supernovae that are much, much further away. We can then figure out distances to them by comparing their apparent brightness to this Cepheid calibrated intrinsic brightness and couple those with redshifts to get a Hubble constant estimate. So it's this kind of three rung uh, measurement that fundamentally depends a lot on, on astrophysics, right? our knowledge of these populations. Um, 
What about the cosmological side of things? So I said we use this, do this using the C and V. Uh, so if we look at the expansion history of the universe, we have the Big Bang here, then we have the C and B being released at recombination, dark ages, structure formation to the present day. And so when we're when we're doing this C and B inference on, on the Hubble constant, what we're doing is we're, we're taking a picture of the universe as it looked essentially 14 billion years ago. That's what the, the C and B is. And then we're using a cosmological model to extrapolate um, uh, our, our kind of understanding of the universe to the present day. So it's nearly a, a, a sort of a 14 billion year um, extrapolation where in order to be able to do this, you have to specify every part of the model, right? All of the interactions, all of the, all of the stuff in the universe. And so this is where obviously this, this problem gets exciting because um, you can immediately say, well, if I don't have this model correct, then maybe I'm not doing this, this C and B inference correctly. Um, and, and, and maybe that's the reason for the disagreement. And this has been true in the past. So the last time the, the kind of cosmological estimate of the Hubble constant disagreed with the local measurement this strongly, it was because it was missing dark energy. Um, and so maybe we're missing something else uh, at the moment. Um, and just to give a very brief example of what this looks like, you know, so these are the Planck posteriors for the Hubble constant um, in extended models. So if we add additional neutrinos, you can see that, that the uncertainty of, of the Hubble constant blows up a bit. If you add uh, massive neutrinos, ditto, and if you add uh, curvature, you can see how the, the inference changes too. Um, and so maybe this time around, we're, we're missing some kind of early form funky dark energy or different types of neutrinos. Um, so it's very exciting from a, from a new physics perspective. But of course, there's a much more prosaic explanation that we've got to rule out first. And, and maybe we've just made, a pro uh, we've, we've made an error in our analysis or we don't understand our data fully. Um, and so it's imperative that we rule this out before we claim anything about new physics. I think the important thing to, to note here is that even if this is the explanation, um, you know, it's not necessarily a bad thing because the C and B and, and direct Hubble constant measurements are super complementary data sets. You know, we get to pin down the universe uh, at its beginning and at its end. And that, that, that then, you know, implies very strong constraints on new physics. Um, and so it, even if the answer is it's systematics, then, then it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, right, okay, so anyway, we, we have these two potential explanations, right? Either it's new physics or, it, or it's systematics. And so we can, we can go through, the, through those two options in a bit more detail. So obviously the first thing that you ask is, is, is it new physics? Because that's the exciting one. And believe it or not, um, theorists have, have generated a few suggestions um, about what the new physics might be. So I started trying to keep track of this um, a few years ago and I gave up because there are now, I think, hundreds of papers about this. Um, but just to, to indicate what, what some of the um, solutions or how some of the solutions fall down, I, I just put together this slide. You can kind of uh, partition all of the theoretical solutions into um, four pots, yeah, right? So one is, is, is you know, there's a potential for the for the theory to change the inferred value of the Hubble constant, but it just doesn't, right? When you when you actually confront it with the data, the central value doesn't change or the, the, the tension persists, right? You, you knock half a sigma off it or something like that. And that can um, that's true for uh, models where, where you know the form of the dark energy changes. Lots of dark, um, late time changes to the universe kind of fall foul here. Oops, well, there we go. There's a much better, I'll, I'll, I'll do that in a minute. Um, there's another set of models where uh, in some small part of parameter space, you can, you can actually change the C and V inference so that it's in line with the local measurement. Um, but it's in such a kind of vanishingly small point of the parameter space that it, you end up with extremely fine tuned models. And this is true for, um, for, for things like uh, N effective or sterile neutrinos, stuff like that. There are some of these um, uh, models that are just too preliminary. They, they haven't been fully fleshed out yet. There are other models that can say, for example, fix the, the CMB, uh, CMB Cepheid distance at H naught tension, but at the cost of making other tensions in cosmology worse. <clears throat> so specifically things like the Sigma eight tension, uh, where there's this disagreement between the CMB and large scale structure about how much uh, stuff, how much structure there is in the universe. And yeah, um, this paper came out maybe a week or two ago by Eleonora Di Valentino that, that has uh, this enormous review of all of the potential uh, new theories that have been suggested um, and, and all of the issues with them. 
So if it's not new physics, then it's got to be systematics, right? Um, but the answer there is, 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 it seems, well, there's no consensus there either. Um, so lots of people, myself included, have, have gone through these data sets, um, changing various aspects of them, um, and, and nothing's really screaming out saying that this is, this is the problem, this is the explanation. Right? So people have looked at the way uh, weird supernovae and cepheids are treated in, in, in the cepheid distance ladder. People have replaced um, optical supernova observations with near infrared. They've done blind analyses. They've looked at the way colors are treated. I think the interesting one here is, is so there's discussions about whether or not the supernova intrinsic magnitude depends on its environment and specifically the age of the host. Um, there's evidence suggesting that that's true, but there's also evidence from other groups suggesting that's not true. So there's a bit of an argument about this. Um, if you wanted to put your money somewhere, it might be worth putting it there. Um, on the CMB side of things, uh, people have looked at taking different portions of the Planck data. So by angular scale, by frequency bands, they've also put together um, different CMB data sets with SPT and ACK data and WMAC data um, and, and basically get the same answer out. So it doesn't seem like there is a, a, a systematic that is currently favored as, as being the explanation for this disagreement. So we're in a situation where we have two potential explanations, but, but neither of them is actually crying out that it's, that it's the correct one. And so we're, we're kind of stuck. We need to figure out how we, how we proceed. And I think the only real way to proceed that's completely orthogonal to you know, trying to dig for systematics and, and look for new theories is to just use new data, right? I mean, this isn't a kind of revolutionary thinking. Plenty of people are thinking this and doing this already and have been doing for a few years now. Um, but essentially what we want to do here is we want to take completely new independent data um, and get a, a, an independent local value for the Hubble constant and an independent um, cosmological inferred value, um, ideally with completely different systematics, right? So we want to find something from the early universe that's totally independent of the CMB, but has the same precision. Um, and on the late side of things, uh, we want to try and find a, a, a ladder free, ideally, estimate of the Hubble constant that has a much lower impact from astrophysics. And as I'm showing on the right hand side, there's already progress being made. And so I'll pick out a couple of these examples to discuss. Um, starting with the with the, the early universe side of things. So what we want here is we want a, uh, a model dependent, so an estimate of the Hubble constant that depends on the cosmological model, lambda CDM, um, but that ideally doesn't depend on the CMB anisotropies at all. And we can do this using um, uh, estimates called inverse distance ladder estimates. Um, and so these are all fundamentally based on, on baryon acoustic oscillations. Uh, I might move my thing here. Um, so those are, you know, if, uh, if you take a, a galaxy survey and you figure out the, um, the typical separation of the galaxies, you, that's, that's basically the baryon, baryon acoustic oscillation scale, right? So this is imprinted in structure formation from the oscillations um, in the, uh, early universe. And so if we have a, an observatory here that's looking out into the sky, doing a galaxy survey, if you do this, um, if you measure this BAO scale along the line of sight, you end up with something that is uh, a measurement that depends on H of Z. So that is the expansion rate at the redshift of your survey. Okay. So if you measure the line of sight BAOs, you probe the expansion rate at non-zero redshifts. So what you're doing here is you're getting a a measurement of the expansion rate maybe a few billion years ago rather than having a picture of the universe uh, 14 billion years ago but you still now need to extrapolate it to the to the present day Oop. so how do we take this measurement and uh, and move it to uh, extrapolate it down to redshift zero to get a to, to get an h naught measurement well so the first thing to note is that the bao survey is actually constrained uh, this quantity, so this H of Z, so this expansion rate, multiplied by RD, which is, is basically the physical scale of that, uh, of, of the separation between galaxies. We'll cover what RD is and how to measure it in a bit more detail. So if we just imagine that's been um, measured for now, we want to be able to get this 
expansion rate measurement down to redshift zero. And we can do that by uh, essentially uh, taking some fun uh, functional form for, for h of z as a function of redshift. So we just say the, uh, yeah, the expansion rate as a function of redshift has some functional form and that can be splines or it can be a Taylor expansion or it can be a Gaussian process. And then we're going to use that function and form to just extrapolate from our measured redshift down to redshift zero. Now, obviously, that's going to be spectacularly imprecise, right? Because these functions can just wiggle all over the place unless you can constrain them with other data. And we do that using uh, things like supernovae. Um, why can we do that? Well, if you take the difference between the magnitudes of two supernovae, you end up with a ratio of their distances and the distances are just integrals over this expansion rate as a function of redshift. So basically these supernova measurements constrain the shape of, of the curve as a function of redshift, which allows you to just extrapolate to redshift zero with essentially no, no uncertainty, which is pretty cool. Um, but like I said, I've, I've skipped over this RD, this physical scale, and we, we clearly need to measure that um, in order to, to do this properly. So how do we measure the, the physical scale of the BAOs? The simplest way we can do that is using the CMB anisotropies, right? Because it's basically the same scale as the as the um, uh, there's a typical size of the fluctuations in the CMB. Um, obviously, if you do that, you lose the independence from from uh, the, the the Planck pure Planck estimate of the Hubble constant, but at least you can do it in a way that um, that minimizes the the dependence on the cosmological model or changes the dependence on the cosmological model, so that it only cares about pre pre-recombination physics, which is, which is nice and is useful in and itself. You can completely remove the CMB though, um, in a way that I think is much more powerful um, because uh, Lambda CDM basically tells you what, the, what the, this RD, this drag scale should be. Um, if you have measurements of the densities of neutrinos and photons and matter and baryons, and so we can get that. We can get the neutrino density from theory. We can get the photon density from um, FIRAS measurements. We can get omega matter, the matter density from, say, for example, supernova surveys or galaxy surveys. And we can get the baryon densities from, from uh, primordial, uh, so Big Bang nuclear synthesis measurements, so measurements of the, of the primordial deuterium abundance. And so what happens when you put all of this together? So this figure on the right is probably the most confusing figure I've ever created, but I'll try and step you through it. Um, so in this panel here, the kind of central panel, what I'm plotting is the expansion rate as a function of redshift. Okay. If you have your BAO measurements and your constraints on the drag scale, what you basically do is that these dashed lines, you constrain H of Z to be within this blue boundary. Okay. And then you can extrapolate it down to redshift zero by assuming some functional form for the, for the dependence and constraining it with, with supernovae where you have this many supernovae. So this is like a histogram of the supernovae that you have available and you have thousands or hundreds of these things uh, in the appropriate redshift range. And you end up with a posterior on H naught, which is this blue curve up here, which is almost identical to the black one, which is the, the pure CMB inference. And this is true uh, regardless of whether or not, uh, of how you get this, the, the constraint on the drag scale. So work that I did use the CMB to do that. You end up with a low value, just like the CMB. So that doesn't agree with the Cepheids. And if you swap in the kind of Big Bang nuclear synthesis way of doing things, you get almost exactly the same answer with the same, you know, almost, uh, what's that, like one and a half percent precision. So CMB or no CMB, this inverse distance ladder agrees with Planck. So this is, this is really cool and it's only going to get better because we have experiments like DESI coming online, which are going to constrain this expansion rate with extraordinary precision over the, the redshift range that we care about. Um, so uh, I will probably skip over this because it's, it's not the world's most clear slide, but um, the fact that you can construct this dis inverse distance ladder to depend on Lambda CDM only before recombination has um, potential consequences for the types of theories that, that might explain this tension. So if you change the late time universe, you don't change the inverse distance ladder measurements, but you will change the CMB inference. And so if you change the late time universe, you naturally create more tension rather than less. Um, and so the agreement between these two measurements strongly implies that any physical solution to this problem has to take place before recombination. 
Okay, so, so if we go back to this plot, now we can say, you know, we have the Planck C and B estimate for the Hubble constant up here. And then we have this inverse distance ladder down here, which has almost exactly the same uh, uh, central value, but with slightly greater uncertainty. And that's telling us, you know, these are two completely independent, different data sets um, that agree with each other in uh, the, the, the model dependent inference that they make. So that implies that we, we, we kind of understand what, what's happening in the early universe. Uh, if we look at the late time universe, these are these measurements here, things aren't so clear, okay? So we have the shoes estimate, which is around 74. And then we have a bunch of different estimates here. So this one is another distance ladder where instead of using Cepheids, they use uh, measurements of the, uh, the, the magnitude of the tip of the red giant branch. This is intriguingly low. However, if you change the way that you deal with uh, extinction, you can move it to something higher, but there's disagreements about whether or not that's the right thing to do. There are others. So Myra's is, is still a distance ladder with, with a different standard candle. There are others that have uh, much larger error bars. The intriguing one here is holy cow. So this is a genuinely, no, there's no ladder involved. This is taking strong lenses. So multiple images of quasars and working out the time delays. Um, between the flares that you see in those images. Um, uh, so that is completely independent of, the, of, of any kind of distance ladder of all Cepheids, of all supernovae. And it looks like it, like, like it agrees with shoes. Um, however, if you uh, improve the way that uh, systematics are modeled in that system, you end up exploding the error bars somewhat. So this is what it looks like if you, if you um, change the, uh, the systematics handling and and other aspects. Um, you can basically move it around quite a lot and change the error bars significantly. And so, I, I mean, my personal view is that the late time universe doesn't have um, the same level of certainty as the early time universe. Um, and so what we really need here is, is a very precise, ideally uh, distance ladder free estimate of, of the whole constant from the local universe. Um, and so that's what I'm going to be talking about for the, for the rest of the talk. Um, and so, yeah, if we want to put together uh, a wish list for a data set that would give us an ideal Hubble constant measurement, um, what would we want? We would want uh, a, a single net connection is unstable. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, it's okay, but it's, okay. it's breaking a little bit. Okay, let me. I might, I might turn my video off for. Uh... It's not too bad, actually. It's uh, it's just slightly. Um, yeah, sometimes it's just slightly laggy, but. Uh, okay. On balance, I think it's probably going okay. Okay, let me see if I can go back. I'll, I won't. Uh, it's because of these beautiful animations. It's not my fault. Um, so yeah, if we wanted to put a a a, a wish list together for the for the ideal data set, yeah. So we would want a set of objects that we can detect. The, hundreds of megaparsecs or 100 plus megaparsecs because that's the point where the the recession velocity is is very dominant over peculiar velocities so we we, we kind of just don't care about them um and we want to be able to get a distance estimate for these for these systems that doesn't involve any kind of distance ladder and ideally minimizes any kind of assumption that we have about uh, astrophysics um, and the cool thing is, is as of a few years ago thanks to decades of hard work by a lot of people uh, culminating in, in the detection of um, these gravitational wave sources uh, by LIGO and Virgo, you know, we, we have these systems, right? So specifically we have observations of, um, of mergers between binary systems made out of, of compact objects, right? So neutron stars and black holes. Um, and so that's what these two animations are showing here. In the top, we're seeing um, a, a binary system made out of neutron stars. We can see them, um, orbiting each other, there are uh, uh, quadrupolar acceleration, so they emit gravitational waves. That means that the orbit decays and they spiral into each other and eventually merge and, and, and explode. Um, and on the bottom, we're just showing the same with, with binary black hole systems where you'll see them merging, but um, with, without any explosion, basically without any light being produced. But the point here is that these things are detectable out to hundreds uh, of megaparsecs in the case of binary neutron star systems, and maybe 10 gigaparsecs in the, in, in, in this, in the case of, of binary black hole systems. 
And um, you know, theory tells us that, that the amplitude of this signal decays as one over the distance. So if we know the intrinsic uh, amplitude of these, of these gravitational wave systems uh, signals, then we can infer the distance directly from the data. And we can do this because with uh, GR, with numerical relativity, uh, we can figure out the intrinsic amplitudes um, as a function of, say, for example, the masses of the sources and their spins, and thereby get direct distance estimates. And so all we need is, is redshifts. And you know, the, the, the hint of how to get that is, is shown in that neutron star uh, animation where at the end it explodes. Right? So you might get a, a, a short gamma ray burst, you might get a kilonova, you might be able to detect the, the afterglow of these systems. And so obviously, um, uh, unless you've been living under a stone, you know that we can do this already, right? So we detected um, GW170017, right, which is a binary neutron star merger. Um, and we can see in this panel here, the gravitational wave sig signal as a function of time and frequency that allows us to get a direct distance estimate for the, for the system. Um, this is the only one we've seen so far that has an electromagnetic counterpart, right? So it, was, it had a, gravita uh, a gamma ray burst and um, an afterglow killing over everything. And so we were able to go through old images and compare them to new images and find this thing popping up on the sky. We can uh, assign that to its, uh, associate it with its, with its nearby galaxy uh, in order to get a redshift and, and, and out pops the whole constant. Um, in a spectacularly clean way. Um, now, of course, this thing ha has precision of around 10 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So it's not currently good enough to distinguish between the CMB and the, and the Cepheid distance set of values. So that's the green and orange curves here. And so the, 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 the game here is, is trying to beat down that uncertainty in, in whatever way we can. Um, and so there's basically two ways of doing this. Uh, the first is, uh, is, is to take more data on individual sources, okay? Um, why does that help? Well, simply because if you, if, you, um, if you do the gravitational wave strains, you find that the biggest degeneracy between distance is, is with the inclination angle, so the orientation of these systems on the sky. And because distance goes straight into the Hubble constant, what you end up with is plots like these. So this is the posterior for GW170817, where you have the Hubble constant and the unknown um, inclination. And you can see that you have this big giant degeneracy, whereby if you could constrain this um, inclination angle, you could potentially um, squash down the uncertainties on, on the Hubble constant. And so people have done this. They've done this by um, taking radio observations of the of the um, uh, of the remnant that was left over after the collision, uh, and then model it using hydrodynamic simulations. And um, what that allows you to do is to place constraints like this purple one here on the uh, basically the orientation of the signal on the sky. And when you combine it with the gravitational wave posterior, you end up with this blue curve here, blue contour, which is the combined constraint on the inclination and the distance. And you can see that that shrunk down the distance uncertainty considerably. And you get a, a reduction of, a, of around two or three um, on, on the H0 uncertainty as a result of doing this. But the problem here is obviously that you end up having to put in a physical model of the remnant. And so if you get that wrong, um, then, then your inference might well be biased. And we want to aim for something as astrophysics independent as possible in the end. And so you know, that's a caveat to bear in mind. So what can you do that's still physical and physics independent? I mean, you can just wait, right? And you can, you can measure more of these things. And so that's what I've been looking into over the last couple of years is putting together simulations of these systems or, or populations of these systems um, and, and working out how many of them you need to, to, to kind of get the H0 uncertainty down to a couple of percent level. And so what this animation is showing um, is the, res the results of a simulation of, of four years worth of LIGO and Virgo um, observations with realistic noise, um, including the, the, the planned upgrades that we should have and including um, all of the analysis tools that LIGO and Virgo use and gravitational wave selection effects and things like that. So the right hand side shows the, the signal to noise ratios of these systems, just adding them one by one. The left-hand plot is showing the H0 posteriors that you get from 
each system in turn. And you can see that they're all quite scraggly. They're all uh, asymmetric and they have these long tails to high H naught. But then when you combine them into the central uh, population H naught posterior, um, you end up uh, getting something that, that looks very Gaussian um, and that ends up having quite, quite low uh, precision. Well, small uncertainties. And so what we basically found was with 50 or so of these detections, which in real time maps onto maybe five to 10 years, you should get down to around 1.2 kilometers per second per megaparsec uncertainty, which is exactly the kind of precision that you need to get to the, the bottom of this problem. And other people have found similar numbers. And of course, if you can fold in the inclination information at the same time, then you can possibly even get there quicker. Um, uh, the cool thing is that, that they're not necessarily the only systems, these binary neutron star mergers um, that might have an EM counterpart. Uh, you might also expect to see these for neutron star black hole uh, binaries, where this is the world's greatest uh, artist's impression of what that might look like over here. Um, this is because uh, if, the, if the neutron star, sorry, if the black hole is not too big in comparison to the, to the neutron star, you end up shredding the neutron star before it's swallowed by the black hole. And so you leave behind material that can then increase onto the black hole or, or form jets, things like that, um, in a way that you could potentially detect with, with EM telescopes. And so some work that just came out uh, late last year, we put together another simulation, uh, another simulated population of these sources. It's a little bit more futuristic now. So this is the kind of A plus era. So it's, uh, I guess, two, two upgrade cycles away, but maybe you could expect this by the end of the 2020s. Um, uh, yeah, of these, of these neutron star black hole systems. And uh, in this case, we didn't just um, include gravitational wave selection effects. We also folded in some electromagnetic selection effects where basically we said uh, there's a model um, which uh, which you can use to calculate the amount of material that's left over after one of these mergers and we require that over a hundredth of a solar mass of this stuff uh, is left over um, in order to produce a signal that we can detect um, and when we do that we end up with populations of maybe a hundred or so of these objects and when you fold them into the to the h0 inference pipeline you end up with uh, precisions that are like uh, 1 to 1.6 kilometers per second per megaparsec, where this uncertainty is basically driven by how the black holes spin in these systems. So if, if, if the spins aren't aligned, um, that changes the, the kind of waveform, it changes the signal that you see and allows um, the distance and the inclination to be, to be separated out. So here's a particular example of one of these systems, and you can see where if the, if the spins are aligned, you get this big long degeneracy between distance and inclination. Uh, and if instead, they're, if they're not aligned, if they're allowed to process, you get much tighter constraints. Uh, and so this is just a, a kind of fundamental physical um, uh, difference between uh, that's based on spins that could potentially have quite uh, important constraints, uh, important impact on, on how well we can constrain the Hubble constant. Um, there's also other systems I've just mentioned briefly at the bottom, where if you have a binary black hole that's in an AGN, um, the merger can kick it through the disk and potentially cause a, um, a, a, a flare that you can see. Um, and so there's a bunch of papers that came out late last year about this, but it's, it's, it's still speculative as to whether or not you can uh, directly uh, assign these binary black hole mergers to specific AGNs. Um, so, so that's potentially a bit more speculative. Um, so if I've got time, yeah, I will just discuss briefly. So, I mean, the point of all of this work is to try and get something that has as few systematics as possible, um, because, you know, the systematics are potentially one of the reasons why uh, this disagreement could be there in the first place. Um, and so uh, I just wanted to briefly discuss a few of the systematics that, that could potentially appear in these measurements. Um, one that we've covered in some detail in this paper led by Daniel Mortlock um, is, is just a, a bias due to the selection effects. So in these systems, we have this classic Malmquist bias, right? We have a population whose number grows with distance. Um, and so we have this, uh, the gravitational wave selection effect basically says we're going to end up with um, more objects being scattered into our sample than out. Um, and so we're typically gonna underestimate things distances, uh, which means we'll end up overestimating the Hubble constant. Um, 
And so in this paper, we just showed how to deal with that in, in, in a standard traditional Bayesian inference pipeline. Uh, it means that instead of using the normal likelihood, so the prob probability of the gravitational wave data given some parameters, we care about the probability of the gravitational wave data given our parameters and the selection function. Um, what that requires is this big integral over data sets, right? So we have to normalize our old likelihood um, with this integral. What that basically involves doing is, is resampling your data set and figuring out the average number of detections that you make for a certain set of parameter values. Um, and so we showed uh, how to do that um, in, in a recent paper using some slightly uh, uh, simpler um, simulations where basically this, the kind of only thing that you need to care about here is the fact that when you, when you repeat this analysis many, many times, you end up with the, the maximum posterior estimates of your analysis coming out back on the ground truth, which is 70 in this case, with um, the expected uncertainties. Um, the one problem here is that you have to do a lot of these calculations, right? To do this Monte Carlo integral here, you end up having to re-simulate your, your sample over and over and over again. And if you're doing this at every point of your MCMC, cheat, MCMC chain, for example, this can rapidly get um, computationally quite demanding, right? You know, if you have a, a million steps and you have to repeatedly sample a population of a thousand sources, you can see how that um, might, might get very slow. Um, and so uh, I just wanted to flag up some work. I don't really have time to, to talk about it in much detail, the work that Francesca has been doing recently where she's put together a pipeline for, for doing this with, with likelihood free inference. So because you don't end up calculating the likelihood, you don't have to do this normalization of the likelihood. Instead, all you have to be able to do is simulate your data with the selection function in it. Um, you still have to do a lot of simulations, but you can do orders of magnitude less simulations than if you were um, uh, doing things this, this, this very traditional Bayesian way. Um, and so I'll just skip that. Um, but if you want to ask questions about it, I'd be very happy to talk about it. Um, so yeah, uh, there's a couple more sim uh, system. Um, the first of which is, is, is estimating peculiar velocities. So for these systems, I mean, the loudest systems are always going to be closest by, um, and their, their redshifts are always going to be dominated by peculiar velocities. And so uh, we've got to be, uh, if we want to use these systems, which makes sense to use them because they're very loud, they're very informative, we need to make sure that our peculiar velocity measurements are, um, are, are correct, right? unbiased. And so there's a bunch of papers that came out, including one by Shuvadeep, uh, a, a couple of years ago now, um, considering GW170 at 17, which showed that um, essentially if you change the way that you, you, you estimate peculiar velocities, um, you can move the posterior around, uh, the Hubble constant posterior around by a few kilometers per second per megaparsec, um, which is clearly an issue when you're talking about a, a tension that is you know, a few kilometers per second per megaparsec on scale. And so people came up with different methods. I think Shavadeep's method of, 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 of going the whole hog and, and you know, modeling the large scale structure distribution and getting the peculiar velocities from that is, is, is particularly compelling. Um, yeah, something's going down outside. Um, the, the other systematic that I wanted to mention um, is, is the absolute strain of the, of the gravitational wave measurements. So if you don't know um, whether you have, say, you know, the strain that you're measuring is exactly equal to the to the strain that's that's hitting your 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 detector, um, then you have a problem because the strain amplitude is directly proportional to the uh, distance, which is proportional to the Hubble constant, and so you know your percentage uncertainty on the strain goes straight through into your Hubble estimate, um, and so. Uh, as of a few years ago, this was around the 4% uncertainty in, in LIGO. Um, but I know that uh, recently people are working to, to kind of beat this down to the, to the level that we need in order to get to maybe 2% uncertainty, you know, statistical uncertainty um, on, on the Hubble constant estimates. So the, the very last thing that I wanted to talk about um, in the last couple of minutes um, 
is is everything that I've talked about so far assumes that you have a, an electromagnetic counterpart to the to the gravitational wave merger. Um, but you can obviously still do this problem, um, even if even if that's not true, even if you can't see any um, counterpart. And indeed, the, the original proposal by Bernard Schutz um, didn't use uh, counterparts at all. And so that's just because the, the gravitational wave signal tells you, you know, not, not only the, the angular constraints on you know, whereabouts this thing is on the sky, but also the distance. So you get a volume um, uh, in which the, the gravitational wave uh, merger event um, was most likely to happen. And so if you can then go with your uh, galaxy surveys, ideally you already have a galaxy survey that's covered that patch of sky, you can basically find all of the galaxies that are in that volume and then play the game of saying, well, if, if the merger was in this galaxy, which has this redshift, then this redshift corresponds to this distance and H0 is this, um, or maybe it was this galaxy or this galaxy or this galaxy. Um, so obviously that is statistically more challenging or it's computationally more challenging. Um, but it does have the advantage of, of the fact that you can use any source, right? It doesn't have to have a counterpart. And there are 10 times more binary black hole mergers than binary neutron star mergers. So, you know, you might take a hit in terms of precision because you have to average over what, um, what the actual host galaxy was, but you immediately get this factor of 10 boost in terms of the number of sources that you have to deal with. So it's, it's, it's not so bad. Um, uh, the, the current estimates right now so people have done this using binary uh, neutron stars and binary black holes. Um, you get 50% uncertainties on, on, on the Hubble constant, but there's, there's a number of studies showing that if you wait long enough till you have maybe a thousand of these sources, you can get the precision down to the 2% level that, that we really need to, to verify against um, uh, the, the Cepheid supernova distance data. And again, um, Shivdeep's name keeps popping up, so uh, you know he has this nice work um, showing uh, uh, with Ben the the fact that you know once you have enough of these events, you can just cross correlate galaxy surveys with the GW events to get to get the whole constant out. Um, the the one very last thing I wanted to talk about is you can do this in a in an entirely different way um, again uh, because uh, the gravitational wave signal doesn't just constrain distance. An inclination. It also constrains, uh, constrains a, a, a combination of basically the, the masses, so the chirp mass of the system, multiplied by one plus the redshift. So obviously, these you know there is information about the redshift in there if you can add in information about the mass. Um, and there are two two settings in which this might be possible. So for example, um, we know that the neutron star masses um, are sharply peaked. Uh, at least in binary systems in our galaxy, we observe the neutron star masses to be quite sharply peaked. And so if we measure this uh, quantity, this redshifted chirp mass as a function of distance in some population, we will see that this quite sharp peak will, will spread itself out. It will change because it's being redshifted. And so you, from that, basically from that plot, you can see the distance redshift relation and back out some information about uh, the Hubble constant from then. And so they've shown that you can get maybe 7% precision from 200 of these objects. You can also do a similar thing for binary black hole systems. That's because we expect pair instability supernovae to, to uh, impart a, a, a mass gap. So basically any stars above some certain mass should just obliterate themselves and not form a black hole. This means that you should see a cutoff in the black hole mass distribution. So if you look at a set of binary black hole masses and you plot, say, for example, the this redshifted mass as a function of distance again, you should see this cutoff changing with distance just because of the, the redshift dependence. And again, you can back out this redshift um, a, a distance relation and therefore Hubble constant out of this. Um, and again, this is paper by Will Farr showing the precision that you can get. This is really cool. Um, obviously you end up with some model dependence, right? Because you need to model the mass distribution, um, but it will prove to be a, a very nice, uh, I guess, check of, of the other results uh, in time. So that's basically all I wanted to talk about. Um, so I guess to summarize, um, you know, I, I think we're well past the point where people uh, have talked about this um, tension being just a statistical fluctuation. Um, it's exciting because it's, it's basically the biggest hint that we have that our cosmological model is incomplete, but of course it might be systematics. We don't really have a compelling explanation on, on either side of, of the argument. Um, and so I think that 
our best hope at the moment for getting to the bottom of this is to use independent data to, to verify the, the local and cosmological measurements. I think the early universe is, is quite well set. Um, we have a totally independent data set that gives us the same value as the CMB. But I think in the late time universe, there's a real compelling need for a, as, as astrophysics independent an estimate of the, of the Hubble constant as possible. And ideally one that doesn't use a distance ladder and I think that these multi-messenger observations of compact object mergers is, is, is a very, very promising way of, of getting that measurement. So thank you. Great, thank you, Stephen, um, for a really great talk. And uh, in spite of the technical difficulties, which really haven't had any impact at all, so <laughs> well. Okay. well. Um, so please go ahead and ask questions. Yeah, I, ha I have a question, Stephen. Um, this is Henry mm -hmm. McCracken. Thank you very much for the great talk. So the universe being what it is, of course, what might happen is that you might have a very precise measurement from the uh, gravitational wave merger events, which is exactly between the two existing measurements. Um, if that happens, is there any hope that those kinds of astrophysical events could give you some information as to what's happening in the other measurements? Yeah, we just pack up and go home at that point, yes. I think, yeah. Uh, yeah, right. So actually I was, I was at a con conference the other week where Bernard Schutz was asked this question and he basically said that he, in that case, he would expect that there was some systematic in, in the gravitational wave data. Um, I mean, the thing is, if it, if it comes out bang in the middle, uh, then yes, it's it's very confusing, but it it's. I mean, you could you could say that there is some uh, difference, you know, like maybe there's some tweak to GR that means that the that the gravitational waves are traveling at you know different speed to the to light, and hence you get some difference between the local distance set of measurements. But there's already very tight constraints on that, right? I think that the the most uh, compelling explanation for that would be that there is the, the, there would be some systematics that still need modeling. Okay, thanks very much for the nice talk again. Um, thank you. On that, maybe I can also add to that this these kinds of non GR effects uh, can also be constrained through um, cross correlations. Um, right, which is an interesting, it's an interesting subject by itself. Um, Luc, you raised your hand. Yes, thank you, Luc Blanchet speaking. So I think that there is uh, another mean to measure the uh, rate shift of, uh, of uh, in the case of a neutron star uh, binary uh, system without electromagnetic uh, counterpart, which is uh, uh, associated with the fact that one can measure the deformation of mm -hmm. the neutron star due to the tidal effect. Mm -hmm. So there is a deformation parameter or the polarizability parameter of neutron stars due to this tidal interaction, which is measured or can be in principle measured. And this parameter uh, depends on the equation of state of the neutron. Mm -hmm. So if you know, if you happen to know the equation of state, actually you can deduce the mass of the neutron yeah. star or a combination of the two masses of the two neutron stars. Yeah. And uh, the important point is that this is a source mass, really yeah. a physical source mass. Why you also uh, can measure, you measure also the redshifted mass from the early in spiral. And so in yeah. principle, you can uh, measure the redshift. Yeah, yeah. No, and so I think, I think this, is, this is why they're so nice. And, and I was discussing this in a bit with the PhD students earlier is this is going to be an extraordinarily data dominated field in a very short period of time. And so you have all of these inbuilt checks, right? So you have the, you can model the mass distribution and see how that changes with redshift. Like you say, right? You know, if you have an equation of state, um, you can get information about the redshifts out through that way too. And you can do all of this within a, a like a self-consistent model that is then, um, that has a lot of data to constrain it. And so you can do these independent checks to see, well, does the redshift that I'm getting by, you know, a counterpart, for example, agree with the redshift that I'm getting through um, the, the tidal deformability stuff and through the mass distributions in a way that gives you confidence that you know you've, you've modeled things correctly 
but yes that's absolutely right and we're, we're currently working out how well we can constrain um the hubble constant using neutron star black hole systems uh using that tidal deformability information so constraining the eos at the same time as, as the hubble constant um in a self-consistent way yeah okay thanks any other questions not um uh, maybe uh, since um we actually still have a couple of minutes uh, maybe i can um ask you to uh unskip the bit uh, about stimulation based inference <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah i mean it was basically just going to be um so right so so why is it interesting so in in the standard bayesian case you have to calculate this um ah, this integral right and you know the, the typical way of doing it is is for every point that you sample you end up regenerating your data set a few times, five or ten times, um, and calculating the like the the fraction of or the number of detected sources, and that rapidly gets quite quite hard. You can also do this by just basically like pre pre simulating a lot of samples as a function of your parameter space and then interpolating that, which is what I did here as a function of h naught and q naught. So just showing how the, the number of expected detections changes as a parameter set. But obviously, you know, gridding only works for a certain dimensionality. Um, you could do more clever things like that. Um, but the point with the with the likelihood free inference is, um, yeah, if your simulations have the selection function baked in, then then you don't need to do anything special when you're inferring. Right. I mean, I, I appreciate that. I'm just like, you're the one who taught me this. So, you know, this slide is not for you, Ben, <laughs> but I mean, what, what likelihood free inference is essentially right. Or, or the, the flavor of likelihood free inference that we're using. I mean, you can, you can, um, if you just have a single, a single parameter theta and you, and you do a, a measurement of that parameter theta hat, right. You want to calculate the probability of the parameter given the data without calculating the likelihood. The, you can basically do that by drawing thetas from your prior. So on this graph here, it's like picking out some random points on the on the x-axis. For each one of those points, you simulate your data. So that gives you a y-coordinate. And if you drop them all down, you get samples from the joint distribution. So you can then fit that joint distribution using some set of functions. In Francesca's case, she's using um, neural density estimators. Um, and then essentially your posterior is just a slice through that fit um, at the observed data, okay? And so that's basically what she's doing. Um, I have no idea if I can find you something interesting. Um, so basically in, in, in her results, um, so she can basically show that you get uh, the uncertainty on the final H naught posterior is, is essentially statistically, like if you repeatedly do this, is identical to um, uh, the one that you get from uh, traditional Bayesian analyses. Um, I think it's got an, an uncertainty on it of around 4%. So there's a kind of scatter of maybe 4%, bigger or smaller. Um, the big thing is that you, you can potentially get a, a small bias in, in the peak. Um, in our case, because uh, the compression that we're doing to the data set to get it down to a dimensionality that we can fit, um, is imperfect. So we're using just a regression network to do that. Um, and the size of that bias depends on how many simulations you're able to do. So if you can do the same number of simulations as, as in the MCMC analysis, um, this turns out to be like a percent level effect. Um, if you're, if you're reduced that, uh, down to, uh, I, maybe an, a thousand less, you you end up with a, a kind of 15% extra uncertainty on the posterior in the end. So it's 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 a, you know, if you have the computer time, you can you can basically get rid of any impact. Um, yeah. But it's been hard work getting to that point. Niall, you were saying something, sorry. No, I was just gonna say that if your data compression isn't working very well, Ben and I, showed that if you only have like one parameter, rather than doing the condition on the data, you can go straight to that single parameter and you can skip compression completely. 
Oh. Oh. Maybe we should talk about that then. That would be cool. Yeah. So it's 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 currently going from like three hundred dimensions down to two. But we don't care about one of the two, so it could be one. <laughs> oh, well, thanks. I was just particularly interested in this in this application. It seems like a really nice application of these ideas. So, thanks. Um, any other questions? Can I ask a question on um, on this slide? Um, so it seems to me that in your third step, when you fit the joint distribution, you are introducing, uh, you're sort of learning something more because you have to fit a certain functional form. Whereas if you directly sliced at theta ops and just looked at the histogram, the simulated data, you wouldn't have to uh, introduce this additional information. Am I correct? Or why is this third step uh, necessary in this? Uh, yeah, uh, so the, the third step is necessary because it, you, so it, because, this theta hat equals theta robs, right? For for any kind of realistic data set, you will never get an exact match between your simulated data sets and the one that you actually observe. And so right. ABC gets around that by saying, um, I'm gonna have some kind of tolerance, right? So I'll, I will- Yeah, that, that's what I was thinking about. Yeah, right. the, the thing about ABC, ABC ends up being quite wasteful if you end up simulating lots of things that are, that are away from this dotted line, you don't ever use them. Um, mm -hmm. So this density estimation like we would for inference, which is what this is, as put together in this PyDelphi code, which uh, uh, Justin and, and Ben are co uh, well, put together basically. Um, uh, the point there is to try and use all of the information, right? So your, your density estimators your functional forms here are trying to say well you know the the distribution of points over here tells us something about the distribution of points down here too and so we can we can kind of share uh, try and make as much in, uh, use of all of the simulations as we possibly can because you know the, the 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 impact of likelihood free inference is strongest when simulations are hard i think it's probably safe to say at least when the posterior evaluation is hard which is typically the same setting. Okay. Uh, yeah, so it's just a way of, of trying to make best use of the information that you've generated. Thanks. Thanks so much. Well, I, let me just say that you're being far too modest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, these are obviously uh, uh, so it's great, very nice work. Thank you. Yes. Um, and uh, if there are no further questions, I guess we're now past uh, midday. Um, and so let me take the opportunity again to thank Stephen for a wonderful talk. Um, uh, and um, maybe the organizers would like to say something about next week or maybe.